Good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Ciao, ciao, everyone. Hello. I hope everyone is doing fantastically well. This is our second class in week two. Time is flying by, and I hope you're really enjoying the university vibe, even beyond these subjects, and you mingle with other students and you are having fun with the societies. Just carpe diem, seize the day. This is a great time of your life. Have some fun. Thank you so much, Joshua, for looking at our chat. Please ask any question. There is no stupid or silly question, just shoot away. We are adding something really cool. We have heard that you like the recap at the beginning of the uh, video uh, on online live lectures that we are doing now. So we thought of adding even something extra on top of it. Go into the description of the online recordings when, when they're gonna be available, and you're gonna see that I'm gonna post the link to another video, which is a recap in the form of a question, of an exercise. It will help anyone who wants not just to see the recap of the content, but also have a little exercise to do that just to jog their memory and bring them back into that particular uh, chapter or piece of content for the course. Hope this helps. Let me know if you like it. Let's dive into our class. As usual, let's start with the recap of what we have done the last time. We have been talking about markets. Specifically, we have been looking at the definition of a market, which is really simple. It's just the set of buyers and sellers that are willing to produce something and buy something. Markets can be so different. They can have a specific place and time, like the fish market in Sydney or on Amazon. They have no time and no place. Hence, the best way to define them is just to think about this very generally as just people willing to purchase and sell something. The other thing that we looked at was the notion of market equilibrium, where the quantity sold and, and the price of a certain good is stable. This happens in many markets where you can expect to find products in the supermarkets and also you can expect a stable price. That's what we call a market equilibrium. Um, now, we introduced the concept of perfectly competitive market. As I mentioned, this is an ideal market. It's not really that easy to find an example of a perfectly competitive market in the real world because this is really, really a market that requires a lot of assumption. But if you think about the wheat market um, or market for, generally speaking, a certain type of agricultural products, those markets are probably, to a certain extent, perfectly competitive. Uh, consumers and suppliers have to be price takers, both of them. Nobody has enough market power to set their own prices, neither consumers nor suppliers, so they just take the price as is. The goods is homogeneous. They all buy and sell the same type of good, exactly the same. There is no externality. The consumption of that good or the production of that good does not create either a benefit or a cost for society. These goods are excludable. The seller can prevent you from consuming them by not selling them to you. And they're also rivalrous in the sense that if you consume a certain good, then another person cannot consume that same good at the same time. Now, you might think, what, what the hell are you talking about, Alberto, with this excludability and rivalry? Well, you know, think of other goods like fireworks. It's very hard to exclude people from enjoying the fireworks. Uh, when they're up in the sky and everybody can see them. And also they're not rivalrous in the sense that unless the city gets really, really congested, the fact that I'm watching the fireworks doesn't really make the fireworks less appealing to you. So there are examples of very important goods that are uh, non-excludable and non-rivalrous, but for the perfectly competitive market, we are thinking about, uh, as I mentioned, things like this Apple Pencil that is excludable if... Um, uh, you know, Apple can decide whether to sell it to you or not and can control that process. Uh, and I own it, and so you cannot own it, so it's also rivalrous. If I use it, then you cannot use it at the same time. Uh, we have also the assumption of full information. Everybody is really, really well informed in this market. And there is also free entry and exit, which you're going to find it's super important 
it's important for people to have the freedom to enter the market if they want to uh, become producers and compete, uh, but also to exit the market if they want to do that, and similarly for consumers. Fantastic. I'm seeing some good reactions about, I think, the video recap with the uh, exercise, extra exercise. Um, this is really good. Let me know after you see it if, if you like it. Moving on, chapter two, supply in a perfectly competitive market. This is where we, we start thinking about how we go, um, how we could build a model of, of supply and demand. And we introduced Steph. Steph is a person that has two activities that they can do, uh, collecting apples or catching fish. And the catch here, the thing that's a little bit different is that uh, they can, uh, as before, uh, catch a fish in half an hour and each half hour they can get an extra fish. But uh, picking up bushels of apples actually take an increasing cost. The first bushel takes one hour to harvest, the second 1.5 hours and the third uh, two hours. It gets more and more expensive to collect bushels of apples as Steph produces them during the course of a day. This is the really important difference here, so keep this in mind because it changes the way we think about the uh, production decision when we have this type of increasing cost of production. I'm gonna do as usual my little trick where I'm not showing you the slides even though I am doing exactly what's on the slides. Uh, you can check them and see that, that I'm telling the truth. Here, I'm just going to write down that table and show you how we connect that with the supply curve for Steph. Now, here is the choice. Uh, Steph can produce that bushel. Bushel of apple. Pss, bushel of apples. Um, and can also fish. Very well. And if you go out so let, let's talk about fish first uh, let's put here the units of fish so this is the first unit of fish the second unit of fish the third unit of fish now what is the total time required to produce this very simple so if you want to produce one unit it takes 0 0.5 um, hours because remember it's half an hour for each fish if you want to produce two units, well, it's gonna take you one hour because, you know, two fish. If you want to produce three units, you have to take 1.5 hour, hours to produce that. But what's more important is that we're gonna add here the marginal time um, to, to this table. The marginal time is simply telling me how much time each additional unit of fish is costing. And because it is, uh, constant productivity for staff for fish, this is really simple. This just tells us that each fish takes us half an hour to produce. Super easy, super simple. Please let me know if you have a question. If anything I'm saying doesn't make sense, ask and, and Josh will be right there to help you. So this is really simple for fish. But let's have a look at uh, bushels of apples instead. Uh, bushels of apples, we have, let's say, one, two, three units that we are thinking of, of producing. This is the total time. Um, and this is the, the marginal, marginal time to produce. We are going to see that we really care about the marginal time, mostly. But I don't want to spoil the fun. Let's go one by one. So the first unit, the first bushel, will take you um, one hour to produce, so that's one hour. What is the extra time for the first bushel? Well, it's one hour. But how about the second bushel? We said previously that producing the second bushel, so going from one bushel to two bushels, so that one to two, that increase from one bushel to two bushel, bushels is actually taking you 1.5 hours. Uh, essentially, the second bushel is taking you one and a half hour, which is more than the, the first bushel, which, which only took one hour to produce. How about the third one? Well, the third one is even more expensive. It takes two hours to produce the third bushel. So if you wanna go from two to three, you're gonna have to spend two hours extra to get that third bushel. Um, now, what is the total time? Well, you, you kind of like, for the first one, it's trivial. For the second one, you need to sum up uh, the marginal times of producing the first one and the second one, which is 2.5. If you want to, which is just the total time, if you want to produce two units, where the first unit 
will cost you one hour and the second unit will cost you 1.5 hours. So that's how you should read this. And if you want to know the um, uh, total time for three units, well, you need to sum this plus this. So 1 plus 1.5 plus 2, uh, which gives you 4.5, which is the total time if you want to produce three uh, units of three bushels of apple. Remember, this is really the column that we are interested in, the marginal time. We want to know each additional uh, bushel, how much it costs. Why do we want that? Well, uh, the reason is that we are going to approach this through the lens of marginal decision making. Marginal decision making basically requires you to think at the margin. Hence, the first question you have to ask yourself is, should I produce one unit of one bushel? Should I produce one unit of apple? Should I do it, the first unit? Well, in order to answer this question, you need to understand what is the cost-benefit analysis, compare the cost to the benefit of what you're doing. And in order to really have a better understanding of the benefit, let me just specify here that you can sell this bushel of apple for $1.9. Whereas you can, so this is apples, uh, whereas you can sell your fish for uh, just half a dollar. One really, really important thing to consider here is that uh, at this point, there is no cost for staff in, you know, catching fish or collecting bushels of apples. Staff doesn't, doesn't mind working, doesn't mind the activity. It costs time but there is no psychological cost or effort cost for staff so no problem uh, they are happy with the work what they care about is just how much money they get out of the production they made staff is characterized as a simulated human being a model they only care about the money so they want to make as much money as possible we don't even know why why maybe they want to buy something we don't know but the important thing here is that staff wants to maximize the amount of money they are making uh, by producing in a specific day all right that's what what they care about so th the first question is should i produce the first bushel well if i do that i'm gonna have a certain marginal benefit out of it so let me let me maybe zoom out a little bit so you can see the whole the whole table for a second. So the marginal benefit of the first unit, right? Let's let's write it here. So the marginal benefit is the extra benefit that you obtain by producing that first bushel of apple. And the marginal benefit, given all the assumptions that I made so far, is actually the price of that bushel. And you can sell any bushel you produce, any single bushel that you produce, always at uh, $1.9. So technically speaking, the benefit, what you like about having produced that bushel is that you can sell it and obtain 1.9. Remember, this is not the marginal benefit of the entire production that you're making in a day. It's just the marginal benefit of that first bushel of apple. So that first bushel will give you that amount of money. Now, what is the marginal cost? And this is where we need to be super careful because, uh, you know, we don't want to think about the cost in just the accounting sense. And in other words, we don't want to look at cost in terms of hours worked because we actually don't know what that means. We don't know what is the value of that amount of time. Like, for example, if I tell you that the marginal cost of producing the first bushel is one hour of time, that is correct because look at this, the marginal time required is one hour. So technically speaking, I have said the right thing. The cost of producing the first bushel is indeed one hour. But uh, how do I compare one hour with $1.9? How do I know if the benefit is greater than the cost? Well, this is not really helping me making the decision here. So what I want to do instead is transform this one hour right into something else. Now, uh, I have to understand what is the alternative use of time for staff 
And the beauty of this simple exercise is that you don't have to do a lot of work to understand what is the alternative use of time, because the only other thing that Steph can do in this very simple world, she cannot, they cannot rest, they cannot do anything else. The only activity they have is fishing. So when they spend one hour going after those apples, they could have instead fish. If they had done so, remember that uh, for fish, have a look at this, it's only half hour, right? For each fish, there you have it. So if you had instead spent one hour fishing, you could have actually caught two fish. Two fish would have been possible. It would have cost you a total of one hour, so half an hour each, and that would have been perfectly fine. So the cost actually expressed in terms of opportunity cost is equal, not really to one hour, which is a bit of a silly way to think about it, but the cost is actually two fish, which you can actually transform into dollars because you know that each fish is worth $0.5, which means that the marginal cost is really $1. Now we are talking. Now I can compare the marginal benefit with the marginal cost, and the cost-benefit principle suggests do that, compare the marginal benefit with the marginal cost. In this case, the marginal benefit is 1.9, the marginal, the marginal cost is $1. The surplus is the difference between the marginal benefit and the marginal cost, so the surplus would be uh, the difference between marginal benefit, which is 1.9 minus uh, $1, which is the marginal cost, for a total of 0 0.9 surplus. This is a positive surplus, which really means, you can see it already, that the cost benefit suggests you should produce the first bushel, because the benefit of selling that bushel, making $1.9, is actually greater than the alternative, which would have been producing two fish, two fish, because half an hour for each fish, uh, at half a dollar each. And you can compute the surplus if you want to have an idea of how strongly you feel about this decision in terms of how much extra surplus this decision provided. What, what we're going to do next uh, at the same time is start drawing this graph here. I'm, I'm going to put it in the little corner, but it's actually kind of important. Uh, this graph will have price on the y-axis and uh, quantity of apples on the bushels, in particular bushels per day, bushels per day. Important to uh, really label this correctly, and this is uh, dollars per bushel. So we are super clear about what we're talking about. Now, what, what we want to do is actually draw uh, how, how many apples uh, or bushels we want to produce at a given price. Now, we have started assuming that our price is $1.9. So this is our assumption, what the what the uh, exercise gave us as a starting point. Hence, I can put in the price column, I can put 1.9, that's the first um, like clue to uh, find a point in, in the supply curve. But then what I need to find is the quantity, the, 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 the quantity supplied, which means how many bushels staff wants to produce at that price. In order to do that, I need to keep going. So I uh, establish that up here, that yes, staff wants to produce the first unit. The answer is yes, but maybe staff wants to produce also the second unit. So the question is, would you want to produce the second bushel of apples? Now, in order to do that, we have to uh, do the marginal benefit analysis again. So let's have a look at the marginal benefit. Let me just write it as MB, marginal benefit, which is equal again to $1.9 because you can sell the second bushel the second bushel you can sell at the same price as the first one. Remember, this is the price per bushel of apple. Each bushel gives you 1.9. So the marginal benefit of the second bushel is exactly the same as the marginal benefit for the first one. This is easy. You can sell any unit, any amount for the same price. Now, how about the marginal cost? Well, the marginal cost, let, let me just write it as MC, marginal cost for simplicity. Well, this is different because if you look at how much time it takes to produce the second unit, 
uh, the second bushel of apple, it's actually more costly than the previous one, is 1.5 hours. And in those 1.5 hours, you could have uh, caught three fish, because remember, half hour for, uh, for, for each fish, so you could have caught three fish, that's the opportunity cost, and this could have been sold for, for a total of three multiplied by the price of fish, which is 0 0.5, for a total of $1.5. Even in this case, you can see that we are still liking the production of the second bushel because the marginal benefit is greater than the marginal cost. 1.9 is greater than 1.5. So the answer is absolutely, we should produce the second bushel. The answer is yes, we love that second bushel. Let's do it. Now, I know it's getting a little tedious, but stay with me because I really want to drive this point home. Let's do the same for the third one. Okay, so should I produce the third bushel? For the third bushel, remember, the marginal benefit stays constant, is 1.9 for each and every bushel that you sell. So what you gain out of it has not changed, but the marginal cost has changed because have a look at your cost of production of the third bushel. So producing the third bushel requires two hours, which means you could have caught four fish, uh, half, half hour for each fish, as we said. So four fish, four multiplied by uh, 0 0.5. This gives you uh, $2. Ah, this is more interesting now. Have a look at this. We have a marginal benefit of 1.9, a marginal cost of two. If you do the surplus, 1.9 minus 2 is minus 0 0.1, suggesting you that uh, actually the third bushel is a no. The third bushel is not as good for me because I could actually do better by uh, catching three fish instead. And of course, the more uh, I go on, so the fourth bushel is also going to be a no because we know that it's going to get just more and more expensive the, the third bushel is going to take you, in fact, up to three hours to produce, uh, according to the exercise. So that's definitely a no. And the fifth one is definitely a no because it gets more and more expensive. So we know when to stop. We want to stop at two units. This is what we want to do. Yes, yes, produce the first two units, but not produce anything more than that. Which means that I can finally uh, start drawing the supply curve. In this case, you, you see in this example, let me zoom in here really, really close and tight. In this example, we uh, only can produce in whole numbers. So I cannot produce 0 0.5 bushels. It's either one bushel, two bushels, three bushels. That's how it works, right? I can only produce bushels in whole numbers. That's the assumption. Uh, and now I can actually check at 1.9, very good. Uh, at 1.9, let me check how many bushels I want to produce at 1.9. The answer is that we want to produce two bushels. Hence, what, what I'm gonna do is, I'm just gonna find this point. At $1.9, we want to produce two bushels. That's the quantity supplied. This is the quantity that the producer wants to supply when the price is 1.9. Uh, and this is a point on the supply curve. This is the first point on the supply curve. You have probably seen the supply curve in high school, if you have taken econ in high school. But here, I guess we are giving you a little bit of more micro foundation. We explain how exactly that uh, supply curve is calculated. When the price is 1.9, the uh, quantity supplied is gonna be two. And of course, if the price were lower, say one, it's very likely that the quantity supplied might have been lower, right? And that's what begins to create that uh, supply curve. If you try different prices, imagine you go, you're very patient, you go and you try zero, you know, 0 0.5, then you, you, you try uh, this price. Suppose you try all the prices and you find all the quantity the, uh, supplied for those different prices, then you will derive your supply curve for this agent. And that was your recap of our last class. Just let's have a look at this. We have been talking about thinking at the margin, one decision at a time, one bushel at a time, the comparison between the marginal benefit and the marginal cost for each successive bushels, 
Uh, we have been talking about marginal benefit and marginal cost, where marginal cost is calculated using the notion of opportunity cost. What are you losing when you get that bushel of apple, which is the fish that you could have consumed and produced, um, and also the cost benefit principle uh, that guides how you should decide the, the notion of economic surplus. And finally, the idea of quantity supplied. At a given price, what is the quantity of uh, bushels that you want to supply? and in particular how this translates into a supply curve that looks a little bit like this. Now, um, I, I don't think it's going to be particularly educational for me to show you all these numbers, but let me just highlight a few things. Like the example that we had was with $1.9 for a bushel of apples. It was this one here, 1.9. And as you can see, this graph correctly finds the point A, which suggests that the producer should produce two units of the good, and that's one of the points. If you try many more points, many more prices, you are going to have a lot of opportunities during your workshops to look at exercises like this, where you pick a price, just literally out of the hat, you pick a price and then you check how many bushels you want to produce at that price. You will see that the uh, usually the higher the price, the more this staff want, want to uh, produce. So it's the tendency for um, suppliers, to producers to produce more when the price of a good goes up. You can verify that assumption and that really means that the supply curve is kind of an increasing um, function of price. The more someone produces uh, is usually driven by the fact that the price is higher. This is a really interesting way to think about the supply curve and for this one I'm going to go back to my sketch because I think it's a little cle cleaner. So this one that I just did today, this one here, like what we uh, examined was the situation where the price was 1.9. I want to keep it really, 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 really simple. That's why I'm going back to this. So we examined the situation where the price of a bushel was 1.9, very simple. And we established that when the price is 1.9, the, um, you know, the, the price that, uh, sorry, the quantity that is going to be produced by this uh, particular uh, producer is going to be 2. This is what we call the horizontal interpretation of the supply curve. Basically, you start from the price and then you go horizontally like this uh, until you gently touch that quantity supply. Then you go on the x-axis down here. And what you find here is the quantity that the producer would want to produce when the price is 1.9. It tells you the quantity that someone wants to produce when the price is 1.9. Uh, I also want to show you something. There is also another interpretation of the supply curve, which goes like this. Like, have a look at this one, this graph, because it's a little more helpful in that sense. Check this particular price here. This is a price two. If you do the cost benefit analysis at price two, you are going to see that um, if the price is 2, the producer is actually perfectly indifferent. The surplus is 0 between producing 2 bushel of apples or only 1. So this is a point where the producer is indifference, indifferent between producing 2 bushels or three bushels. So when the price goes up to two, the producer, I mean, check with the horizontal interpretation of, of the supply curve. Go, 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 go until you touch the supply curve. This is telling you that basically there are two points that are possible here. One is two bushels and one is three bushels. This really means that the supplier is indifferent. The surplus of producing the extra third bushel is zero. There is a complete indifference between producing two or three. And you can, I mean, literally, I know this when, when it gets a little complicated, but just have a look at this. The price is two, but here you can see that the supply curve has two points in it, which means that producing two or three gives staff the same profit. They are indifferent. In that case, we can use this point here, the point of indifference, 
to interpret this in a vertical way. So take the third unit and go up gently, go up, up, up. I'm gonna clean this so it's really clear. This is the vertical interpretation because what we do is we start from a given quantity, we go up, up, up until you gently touch the uh, supply curve, okay? This is the supply curve. And then you go to the left, like, like this, to the left. And what you find here is the price, which is $2, okay? Uh, and, and this price is the minimum price that uh, staff would be willing to accept in order to produce the third unit. So it's a little bit different than the other interpretation. This interpretation says, in order to produce the third unit, unit number three, you would have to receive at least $2 or more. Okay, so this is the uh, whole vertical interpretation of the demand curve. You start from a quantity and then you check on the y-axis. You're gonna have a lot of opportunities to look into this, the horizontal and vertical interpretation of the supply curve. So no worries uh, about it. But this is essentially the lowest price that $2 is the lowest price that um, staff is willing to accept to produce three units. If the price goes up, say to 2.5, you can see that there is no indifference anymore. Really staff has only one point on, on their supply curve. So clearly at 1.5, sorry at, at 2.5 dollars you have that staff definitely wants to produce three units so now there is no doubt but every time there is a point like three dollars of indifference when you have two points on the supply curve that's where basically that is the minimum amount of money that you should uh, pay staff if you want staff to consider expanding from three to four bushel of apples the higher the price, the more bushel of apples we get. Very well. Now that we have uh, concluded this first part, where we have looked at the vertical and horizontal interpretation of the supply curve. So the horizontal is start from a price, use the supply curve to derive the quantity. And the vertical one, which is a little more tricky, start from a given quantity and find the associated price on the supply curve. This is the minimum amount of money that the producer is willing to accept to supply the marginal unit of that good, which is called the producer reservation price. The smallest amount of money that you have to pay the producer to produce that third or fourth, fourth unit. If you want to have that unit produced, this is the smallest amount of money that you need to pay. And with this, we have actually finished uh, one uh, big chunk of this class. So I might uh, slow down one second now, stare you in the eye, just check that everything is going well, and ask you the usual question, which is really, really important to me. Is everything okay? Is the pace of this class okay? Can I move on to the next content? Remember, you don't have to interrupt me, although you can ask me direct questions and Josh is gonna tag me in that case so I can see it. But otherwise, you can ask Josh as we go. However, it is important for me to actually know if the speed is good, if I should go faster, slower, if there is anything that needs a little more attention, please let me know. And I'm very, very super happy to adjust this doesn't doesn't need this is not a recording and the reason why i don't like recording my classes is that well uh, i give you the opportunity to tell me if the pace is good and i can make uh, uh, changes immediately also i really like coming out on person in my live classes and not just post the recording because if i ask you to spend time watching this it feels better to me if I'm also spending the time, if you know what I mean. I am showing up and you are showing up and it feels more equitable if we both show up as opposed to see a recording of me uh, from 20 years ago, which by the way, I would probably look better 20 years ago than now. That, that would have been a plus of the recording, but it's it just not matching your effort and that's why I keep doing these live classes. Uh, very well. I, I think I bought a little bit of time here, honestly, just to, to wait for, um, for the answer. It seems like uh, the uh, pace is good. Okay, okay. But feel free to also have um, constructive comments, right? It's, it's perfectly fine. I'm going to send a couple of hearts for those who are 
uh, following this and uh, give me comments. It's really, really good. If you give me like some feedback, you're probably speaking on behalf of uh, a lot of other students. So just one of you might be speaking on behalf of 30, 40 other students. So I, I really, um, I really find it find it useful. Okay, so is, Isabella is saying that worries me a little bit because of what I just said about uh, you know multiple people having probably the same problem. Isabella is saying uh, I'm finding the pace is a bit fast at the moment. Okay, so Isabella, can I ask you to do an experiment for me? Could you ask if you if there was anything that was confusing that I've done so far? Could you ask Josh in the chat? You probably benefit many more students that are also following uh, or that are going to watch the recording. And if you cannot quite get the answer that you want from Josh, just flag it and I'm happy to go back and redo it. All right, so just redo that part that was not clear to you. I have a feeling that the interpretation of the supply curve could be a little tricky and also that thing where you have at a certain price a person is indifferent between producing, say, three or four bushels and the interpretation of what that price is, like the price where you are indifferent. Um, so I might, I'm, I think that's the part where maybe uh, I might have lost someone and I'm happy to, uh, to redo it. Now, speaking of this next part, as usual, I'm going to try to uh, just draw the table um, by hand so that we can discuss a lot of these concepts that you see in the slides, which may be very, very uh, abstract if you just look at the definition. But hopefully, by, by giving you the table immediately, the numbers immediately, you might be like, oh, yeah, OK, that makes sense. What we're looking at is a, a situation that's a little bit different than um, uh, tests catching you know, fish and collecting bushel, because in this part of the class, we are going to introduce the concept of a firm that actually needs some machinery, some machinery uh, to do some, some work, right? So, so imagine it's a bottle factory, and this is a machine tuck, 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 that's, you know, producing the, producing the goods. So my drawings are terrible, but this is a machine, right, in, in the factory. Uh, which means that kind of in this kind of example, we are going to have a cost that is associated with that um, factor of production, which is the machine. Now, let's imagine a situation like this. For, for this production that you're doing, you need workers. You need people to actually work alongside the machine. So you need workers very well. And this is, we're we going to call that W, uh, number of workers. And it could be, for example, zero workers, okay? You could start from having absolutely zero work. There's no worker here, for example. Fantastic, what does that mean? Well, with zero worker, uh, I'm sorry, you cannot produce anything. So the quantity that you produce is zero. So the quantity, which is uh, also called Q sometimes in, in the slides, the quantity Q is gonna be zero when you uh, have higher zero workers. Fantastic. Then let's talk about the fixed cost. What is this fixed cost? Now, this fixed cost is basically the amount of money that you have to pay to the bank to um, es essentially pay for the loan on this machinery. So this is the tricky part. Notice that uh, we're going to call this uh, FC. N notice that this fixed cost is actually $100. And you may be wondering, wait, wait, wait a second, I am making I'm not hiring any worker, I'm not producing anything, and I'm still paying $100? That's the very definition of a fixed cost. Now, remember, you went to the bank, you started a loan to buy this machinery, and we are assuming that you are in a certain period of time where you cannot easily resell that machinery. You cannot resell it. Resell it is no good because it takes a little bit a little bit of time to do so resell the machinery it's a no you have this machinery on your hands in your hands uh, you cannot resell it and in the meantime you need to pay the bank hundred dollars every day or every week or every period to actually repay your loan this is what we call a fixed cost 
even if you produce zero, it does not depend on the quantity that you produce. Even if you produce zero, you have to pay this fixed cost. Then we have the variable cost. I'm gonna have to be a little more, I'm gonna have to write this a little bit uh, variable cost because of being too generous with the size of this thing. So the variable cost, which we call VC, variable cost, is actually zero. Why? Because the variable cost is the amount of workers that you're using to produce this, right? This is the amount of workers that you are using to produce zero quantity. But because the quantity produced is zero, Okay, so I'm gonna actually, variable cost. Um, so because VC, variable cost, because you are not hiring any worker, right? No workers, you are paying zero variable cost. Uh, workers are variable in the sense that if you want, you can hire zero of them and you can actually pay them zero. Uh, the cost of workers depends on the amount that you produce. That's why we call it a variable cost. I've been doing this because really, I just want to shrink this, if I can, with my tablet. Let's see if this works. I'm gonna just shrink it. Oh yeah, this is, uh, this is really good. So this is it, workers, fixed cost, variable cost. Now, let's uh, also define the total cost. Total cost is uh, TC, also called TC, and in this case, it's just uh, the fixed cost plus the variable cost, so this plus this. 100 plus zero gives us 100. In fact, when you're producing zero bottles and you hire zero workers, the only thing you need to pay is the loan to the bank, so this is $100. Then we have what we call, this, the, uh, this section here is the average cost. So we do this for a variety of reasons. Stay with me for a second um, because it won't make a lot of sense uh, at the beginning, but it will in a second. So the variable uh, cost here, the variable average cost, which we call AVC, is equal to the variable cost divided by the quantity. And the um, total average cost is gonna be given a, a, again, so the total variable cost is gonna be given by the, uh, so we're gonna call it average total cost, and it's gonna be given by the total cost divided by the quantity. So this is really simple because you take the total cost, right? And you divide it by the quantity produced. And otherwise for the other one, you, you, you take the variable cost and you divide it by the quantity produced. In this case, because you are dividing something by zero, so the quantity is actually zero, all this is actually not well defined as, as a value because uh, dividing anything by zero, as you know, it doesn't give you uh, a well-defined number. So when production is zero, this stuff is not well-defined and that's okay. So I'm just gonna sh shrink this like this. So in, so, in, so in this case, this is total cost, $100, and this is not well-defined because I cannot divide something by zero. And finally, we have at the end here, the maybe the most important part, it's called the marginal cost marginal cost of producing that extra uh, bottle that here we are making an example of. So this marginal cost, let me, let me actually write it up here. Marginal cost, marginal cost. Uh, it's defined as uh, MC, we call it, we denote it uh, with MC and it's the change in total cost divided by the change in quantity. And because again, the change in quantity uh, is zero in this case, we cannot well define this value for now. But this is just the range of things that we're gonna look at. We are gonna look at the number of workers we're gonna hire, how much uh, product we can produce with that amount of workers. We are gonna look at the fixed cost, a cost that we have to pay anyway, no matter how much we produce. And then we're gonna look at the variable cost, which is the cost of hiring workers. And this actually varies with the number of things that we produce. The total cost is simply the sum of the variable and fixed cost. And then the average costs are simply the variable cost divided by the quantity that, that you're currently producing. And the average total cost is the total cost divided by the quantity that you are producing. These are kind of, uh, they're not super interesting numbers, but I want to keep them there because they're part of the table. And there is a little interpretation that um, 
that you can use there to, to understand it. I'm just setting this problem so you understand where we are coming from when we talk about variable costs, they change with the amount to produce, and fixed costs. And hopefully, when I, I draw the second line for this, you will be like, ah, okay, now I get it. Now I get what the variable cost and the fixed cost is. So let's, in fact, have a look at this, a little closer look at this. In the meantime, I'm also keeping an eye on what's happening in the chat, because I promise uh, Isabel La to keep an eye on this. All right, let's have a look. Okay, Isabel is probably still thinking about it, which is great. Okay, switching back to my, my thing. All right, so what I'm doing next is just you're going to see it's a table that's in your slides. So I'm just kind of writing down the table in stages so you can understand it. But this is basically information that is given you by the exercise. So I'm not deriving any number for now. I'm just writing them down. And as I write them down, I am explaining to you what they mean. Hopefully that will make everything easier to understand when we actually get into the decision of this firm in terms of how much this company, this firm wants to produce. So the exercise says this, when you hire one worker, you can actually produce 40 bottles or whatever the product that you are selling or cans. Maybe these are cans, but it's just anything. It could be a product. 40 units of that product when you hire one worker. Fantastic. You can see that the worker is giving you some product now. But notice one thing, your fixed cost stays the same. And this makes sense. It's called fixed. You are in a situation which we call short run, uh, when in the short run means you don't have much time to sell the fixed factor, you don't have much time to renegotiate the loan, so you end up paying $100 irrespective, no matter what you produce. You're kind of stuck because you are in what we call the short run, which is a period of time where some things cannot be changed. In this case, you cannot sell the machinery, you cannot go talk with the bank, you just have to cough up the money, unfortunately. Now, the variable cost in this case, it's actually $12 because each worker, each worker costs you $12. So now that you have one worker, you have to pay their salary. And this is a variable cost because it changes with the amount that you produce. And you can see that it's true. From 0 to uh, 40, you go from $0 to $12. That, that cost varies with the amount you are producing. So that makes perfect sense. The fixed cost does not vary. Hence, it's a fixed cost. That the total cost is just the sum of the two variable plus fixed, so in this case is 112. And in terms of the variable uh, average cost and the total average cost, you just take the, the variable cost, which is $12, divided by the quantity, which is 40, you are making 40 bottles or cans, and that leads you to 0 0.3 variable cost, uh, average variable cost and the total cost is the total uh, amount the total cost which is $112 uh, divided by the quantity so total cost divided by quantity and this gives you it's very simple to calculate if you have the table in front of you this is 2.8 but maybe the most important part of this table is when we introduce the concept of marginal cost so the marginal cost is the extra cost of producing uh, the uh, extra 40 units. Hence, look at this. Now, basically, if I go from zero worker to one worker, I am essentially going from zero quantity to 40. This is the change in quantity. The quantity has changed from zero to 40, so the change in quantity is 40. Now, the other thing that you have to look at is the change in total cost. So the, the total cost went up by $12. The total cost, so the change in total cost, when you decided to move from uh, zero workers to one worker is uh, 112 minus $100, which is equal to 12. 
This makes sense, right? Because when you hire the extra worker, you get a boost, an increase in quantity equal to 40. You go from zero to 40. And also you have an increase in total cost. The increase in total cost is not given by an increase in the fixed cost. This stays the same. There was no change in your fixed cost. You still pay $100 no matter what. The cost that has increased is indeed the variable cost because now you're hiring a worker. So this is what has changed. My pen is not working. What has changed is the variable cost because now you have one worker, so you are actually paying the extra salary and that takes you from zero to $12. Fantastic. So what has changed is the uh, total cost in the end, but not because the fixed cost has changed. What has changed is the variable cost. And so this change in total cost is equal to just $12. Now, if you do um, this calculation, you, you do the total cost, the change in total cost, which was $12, divided by the change in quantity, which was 40, you obtain that the marginal cost is 0 0.3. This is the marginal cost. Uh, what is this marginal cost really telling you? This is really important. I'm going to use my hands like any good Italian would do at this point. So. The marginal cost is not just the marginal increase in the cost of production, which in this case will be $12, right? When you hire the first worker, you go from paying a fixed cost of 100 to paying a fixed cost of 100 plus $12, which is the salary. So the change in total cost is just $12, the salary of the person. That's what has changed when you hire the first worker. Uh, so this, in theory, you could think of this as, oh, that's the extra cost that I'm paying for hiring the extra worker. And that's correct. But what we want to have here is actually an idea of what each bottle costs you, okay? So it's not just the extra worker costs me this. We want to know what is each extra can or each extra bottle, how much it costs you. And in order to do that, you have to take this $12, which is the increase in cost, and divide it by the change in quantity, which is 40. Now you know how much each single can, when you move from zero workers to one worker, cost you. This is so important. I want to I wanna do it again. I feel, I can almost feel that uh, this could be a great, a great question. Uh, that, that will come up sooner or later. So it's not just the change in total cost, the extra cost that you pay for the extra worker. You also want to know how much each one of these bottle or cans cost. So like you've got 40 of them, right? 40 bottles all in a line. And all these 40 bottles cost you an extra $12. So you actually want to know each one of them, each one of them. What's the, the extra cost for each one of them? And it's not $12 each. It's actually $0.3 each. Each of these cans are actually costing you uh, $12 divided by the quantity that you, you are producing when you hire the first worker. Why is this so important? Because when we do the cost-benefit analysis, we want to com uh, compare the marginal cost so we want to say, is the marginal cost um, higher, greater, or less, or equal to the marginal benefit? And so we want to actually compare, basically, how much each, each, additional, each additional can cost with the price that you can get, the market price of each additional can. That's why we divide the marginal cost by the quantity, because we want to compare the dollar price that you obtain from each can with the uh, cost of each can. And in fact, that's what the kind of exercise uh, asks you to do in this case. It asks you to um, make up your mind in terms of whether you want to uh, hire the first worker. Okay, so let's let's do it together. Let's do it slowly because this is important. So if I hire the first worker, okay, I can produce 40 uh, cans, right? So I hire the first worker and I can produce 
an extra 40 cans. So that's the extra production. That is increasing my total cost from 100 to 112. So te uh, $12 is the increase in cost associated with hiring that first worker. Now I divide that cost by the number of bottles that I'm producing, which is this part. I divide those $12 by the number of bottles and, I op and I'm obtaining what is the extra cost of each bottle or each can when I am uh, hiring the first worker. So you hire a first worker and the additional cost for each can that you have produced is $0.3. Now this is your marginal cost, $0.3. And you compare this with your marginal benefit. And the marginal benefit is given uh, by the, the problem. And in this case, the marginal benefit is equal to the price of a can. As a firm, you can sell each can, each one of them, each can can be sold for $1.2. So this is given by the exercise. So I'm just making it up essentially. This is just a number, um, an assumption. The price that you can sell this can at is what you can charge is $1.2. Uh, $2. So each can gets you a marginal benefit of $1.2. And each additional can, when you hire the first worker, gives you an extra cost of 0 0.3. You can easily compare the two. 1.2 is the benefit, 0 0.3 is the cost. The benefit is definitely greater than the cost in this case. So you should hire the first worker. It's exactly the same uh, decision making that we use for staff. We calculate the marginal cost, compare it with the marginal benefit. If the marginal benefit is greater or equal to the marginal cost, then we take the action. In this case, the action is that we have been uh, talking about. The action is hiring the first worker, going from one worker to two, to, from zero workers to two, one worker. Of course, we also have to make the next decision, which is, should I go from one worker to two workers? And should I go from two workers to three workers? The exercise, which you are gonna find for sure in your final exam and for sure in your assessments during the term, you're gonna see this over and over in workshops. So if you have the slightest doubt about this stuff, please go to workshop. You can go to any workshop you want, anytime. Don't even worry about anything just show up and ask questions about this because it is going to be something that you're going to see in the exam and it's really important in terms of um, what we have just done using the table we went quickly over the idea of a sunk cost it's a cost that once paid cannot be recovered your machinery uh, this machinery that i was talking about is a sunk cost in the sense that once you bought that machinery and you started a, a loan, that is a sunk cost in the sense that you cannot recover it. You have to pay $100 no matter what each period. Also, we talked about fixed factors of production. In this case, is the machinery as uh, some, a factor of production associated with the cost that does not vary. And the fixed cost is a cost associated with the fixed factor of production. The fixed cost does not change with the amount you produce. A variable factor of production is a, a, a linked to a cost that tends to vary with the quantity produced, and we call the variable cost a cost associated with that, which is, the, in this case, the wage of the uh, workers. Then we have the definition of short run, where at least one of the factors is fixed. I was telling you that you have to pay $100 every time, no matter what, you're stuck because you are in the short run. One of those fixed factors exists. At least one of the factors is fixed. In this case, the machinery is fixed. You cannot sell it. You cannot renegotiate the loan. However, in the long run, things are a little bit different. This is a period of time where all factors of production become variable in the sense that you can sell the machinery if you want, you can renegotiate the loan. In the long run, you have more time to adjust, so you are not stuck having that cost every day which, which is coming into your, your bank account. This was the table. I did my best to write this down in an easy way to look at um, for you and also 
like build it stage by stage because otherwise this can be very very dense uh, you can see that it's quite dense but it is what we just uh, saw together if you hire zero workers you can produce zero but because you are in the short run you have a fixed cost that you can pay that you have to pay no matter what see no matter the number of workers that you hire and no matter how much you produce based on that you can see that the fixed cost of production is actually fixed it doesn't vary but the variable cost changes if you produce zero you don't have to hire anyone but of course if you want to produce more you have to hire more people and so the fixed cost the, the variable cost goes up uh, the total cost also goes up because you hire more and more workers and take a look at the, at the marginal cost this is also incre uh, sorry initially decreasing a little bit from 0 0.3 to 2, 2.4 0.24, sorry, but then it begins to increase again. 0 0.4, 1.2, 2.4. And this is just coming from the technology of production. You can see it here. When you go from zero to one worker, you get a plus, a boost of plus 40 units. When you go from one to two workers, you get even more bang for your buck. You get an increase of 50 units. But after the, the second worker, you start having increasing marginal cost. The increase in production is only 30. You are paying the extra worker the same, right? You are hiring one extra worker, you are paying $12, but you are getting out of it only an increase of 30 units. When you go from the third one to the fourth one, you only have an increase of 10 units, right? This is actually not really that good. You can see that the extra units that you are producing are getting smaller and smaller. And the idea is that if you have a machinery, uh, which is your fixed factor of production, which is beautiful, putting the bottles there, if you have only one worker, that's really a productive process. But suppose you add another worker, well, that could be even more productive. There could be like even economies of scale where having two workers allow them to operate the machinery even better. But then when you start adding, say, the third worker, they kind of get in each other's way. They're like, hey, give me space. Uh, there is not enough space to maneuver this. Uh, if you add even another worker, they get even more unproductive. They're kind of piled up. Uh, and uh, with this fixed amount of technology, they kind of get in each other's way. This works in a number of situations. Think about PCs or computers or um, you, know, you know laptops. You have one fixed amount of laptops. The more you add people, the more it becomes hard for them to use the same laptops and work on the same fixed amount of capital. This is basically what's happening here. You can see that the quantity uh, produced initially increases at good rate, but then it starts decreasing uh, up to only five extra bottles when you hire the fifth workers. So that's not very that's not very productive at all. In fact, very well. Now the the main question is. Uh, that, that we looked at is, should you hire the first worker? And what we showed is, well, if you hire the first worker, this worker produced 40 cans. Um, you can make, you can sell them at $1.2 per can. This is the marginal benefit of uh, selling a can, mar marginal benefit. There you have it, MB. Uh, you have also a variable cost for that first worker, which is the wage of the worker. So if you do the change in total cost, which is $12, divided by the change in quantity, which is the extra 40 cans that this worker has produced, you get to the marginal cost that we have been talking about, 0 0.3. This is the value here, right? 0 0.3 marginal cost of hiring the first worker. That's exactly what we did a second ago. And the marginal benefit is the amount of money that you can make by selling that unit. Now, essentially, what you're going to do is you're going to always compare. Let's have a look at this because this is going to be really, really simple for us to do. Uh, if you compare this, uh, the marginal cost with the price at which you are selling, which is $1.2, right, for each uh, extra bottle, then clearly the marginal benefit here is, is higher than the marginal um, cost, so you want to hire the first worker. How about the second worker? Well, it's 1.2. Uh, for each additional can and the marginal cost for each additional can is only 0 0.2 so absolutely you want to hire the second worker how about the third worker oh yeah you like that too because the benefit is 1.2 and the cost for each can is only um, 
you know, 0 0.4. And here it's interesting because you are indifferent at this point. See, the marginal benefit is equal to the marginal cost in this case. We are assuming in this course is just a convention that if you are indifferent, you go ahead and produce it. But of course, you wouldn't want at all to, to hire the fifth worker because no, you are going to pay a, an extra cost for cans that is 2.4 when the extra benefit is only 1.2. This is because while the uh, price at which you can sell this good, your can, is constant, 1.2, your technology is such that every additional worker after a certain point, they become less and less productive. And that brings an increasing marginal cost to the point where you get uh, to this situation where um, the marginal cost is clearly too high for you to be willing to produce, to, to, to hire this fifth worker. So the fifth worker here is a no. That's how you solve this exercise. Calculate the marginal cost, calculate the marginal benefit, and go on expanding the number of workers until the marginal cost is equal to the marginal benefit, like this, and then check if the next one is actually worth doing or not. And if it's not, then you're, you're done. This is the optimal amount of workers, which is four workers to be hired. What we're gonna do also um, is kind of, and I'm gonna anticipate this a little bit, but you're gonna see it. We want to actually plot these values, like for example, the marginal cost. We want to plot this column into uh, a graph that looks like this, that has the price, um, sorry, the cost the marginal cost, if you want, on the y-axis and the quantity on the x-axis, right? So we, we are going to basically just plot this. We are going to look at the quantity that you are producing, like, for example, from uh, 40 uh, cans is associated with a marginal cost of 0 0.3. So we're just going to plot it like this. I know it's super simple. You just basically plot this and the quantity. And then you do the same for, for example, this other quantity, 90, right? And you just plot 0 0.24, which is down here, and so on and so forth for the other quantities. This is just a way to visualize the marginal cost. And you can see that the marginal cost of production is kind of initially decreasing a bit and then increasing because technology gets worse and worse at producing this. Very well. Now, let me um, go over some of the things that we just said. We uh, are seeing in these slides that four workers is, in fact, the optimal amount of workers. And it's going to give you a, a profit, which is calculated as the total revenue which is the number of bottles that you can produce multiplied by the uh, price for each bottle. So you would produce 130 bottles with four workers and you sell each bottle at 1.2. So these are your uh, revenues, quantity that you are selling multiplied by the price that you are charging. And the total cost is the fixed cost plus the variable cost, which is 100. This is the fixed cost plus uh, 48, which is the variable cost, this gives you the total cost of production. If you do the total um, revenue that you make, remember, this is the profit when you hire four workers. Okay, four workers, you make uh, the maximum amount of profit that you can because you have been using the cost benefit principle. That's the optimal amount of workers. If you do total revenue minus total cost, you get that the, your profit. So the difference between revenues and cost is the profit, and it's equal to $8. Definition of profit represents the difference between the total revenues and the total cost. Fantastic. Uh, one important, very, very important thing to keep in mind is that uh, you need to, after you make your decision, and you use the cost benefit principle, right? So that's basically what we did. We did the cost benefit principle, and we concluded that it's optimal to hire four workers. What do I mean with optimal? I mean that this is the uh, amount of workers that maximizes your profit. It makes your profit the biggest that it can be. If you don't believe me, try 
any other amount of workers would not give you higher profit. So try with three workers, compute the profit, total cost minus total revenues, you're gonna see that it's lower than eight or equal to eight, but you cannot do better than hiring four workers. So this is your top profit. That being said, you always have to think about this decision in two steps. The first step is make profit as big as possible, maximize profit. Choose the, what, what is the number of workers that maximizes profit and you use the cost benefit analysis. In this case, the number was four. But after that, you have to think about should I stay in this market or not? Should I stay in the market or not? Stay or not? And this is a different decision. For this decision, you need to compare what you are making by staying in the market and hiring four workers and making the maximum profit that you can, which is equal to eight, or actually shutting down and uh, producing zero. In this case, remember, because you are in the short run, if you shut down, you still have to pay your fixed cost. So if you shut down, it's not that you can make zero profit, you still have to pay the bank. So you would make minus $100. Hence, if I change the values, for example, I make your life much, much harder in this example, and I move your, uh, the price that you can get out, that you can charge for each can, uh, say from $1.2, as in the example I made, suppose that I take that down to $0.4, I'm making your life as an entrepreneur much harder here because I'm reducing the, the price that you can charge. So imagine that. Well, it's bad for the firm. If you do the cost benefit analysis, the answer is now you would hire less people. Three workers is the best that you can do if you apply the cost benefit analysis when the price of each bottle is 0.5. Please give that a check. Try this and, and confirm. It's going to be an exercise that you see in your workshop. Basically, I change the price of a bottle. This changes the cost benefit analysis that we have been doing. Uh, this leads you to an actual lower profit, whereas the uh, cost is pretty high. It remains at um, 136. So this is something that trips students all the time, because if you find uh, this answer, the answer is, Okay, we want to hire three workers. The maximum profit that we can get, it's when we hire three workers. And the maximum profit is actually negative. In this case, this is not looking good for the company. When they do the best they can, they use the cost benefit principle. They are smart about it. They still lose $88. Ooh, that's not good for the firm. Uh, but, you know, 80, losing $88, it's actually better than losing $100 if you shut down. So remember, if you shut down, you still have to pay the fixed cost, which is $100. So the real comparison is between doing the best you can and losing $88 or shutting down, producing zero and actually losing $100. So sometimes you have to continue producing even if you're running a loss. And this is because there are fixed costs at play. But the good news is that this is only a, a situation that happens in the short run when you cannot get rid of your fixed factor. In that sense, you should produce in the short run as long as your highest profit, the maximum profit that you can get is actually, so sorry, you should sh uh, shut down in the short run if the profit is so low that it's actually worse than your fixed factor. If you are making even a bigger loss than what you would make by shutting down, then you should shut down. This is basically just producing zero and incurring the fixed cost, but it's better than uh, uh, producing because in this example here, when this condition applies, the profit that you make is even smaller than that loss from the fixed factor. But in the long run, when you can get rid of the fixed factor, you do not have to worry about incurring loss because uh, in the long run, you can just sell the fixed factor or stop the loan to the bank. In the long run, you have more freedom. You don't have fixed cost. So if you decide to shut down in the long run, you can actually get zero profit. So if you shut down and exit the market, 
in the long run where everything is adjustable, you can actually get out of the market and make zero profit. So this is your alternative. Remember in the other case, the shutdown condition um, meant that you still had to pay the fixed cost, but in the long run, there is no fixed cost. So you can exit the market and actually make zero profit. So you should actually in the long run exit the market as soon as your best profit that you can make goes below zero if you're making a loss in the in the long run you're just gonna exit the market instead so i've been telling you that uh, if you plot the table that i just did for you you would obtain something that that looks like this uh, just like this graph and if you could hire people not in discrete amounts like hire zero workers or one worker or two workers but suppose you can hire people you can hire 1.5 workers or something like that that would mean like i know that it sounds crazy that you hire 1.5 workers how do you do it do you cut a worker in half no what we mean is that maybe you hire them part-time um so if you can hire people part-time and actually uh, kind of hire 1.1 worker or 1.2 workers then your graph would move from being a discrete graph like this where the only quantity that you can produce it's even 40 or 90 like we saw in the table or 120 it would look more like a smooth gentle graph like this but otherwise the the shape of these um, curves the marginal cost the average total cost they would look the same and remember these are taken straight from the table so there is absolutely nothing that you need to calculate here just plot the, that table putting the cost on the y-axis and the quantity produced on the x-axis so that's as simple as that the uh, supply curve is it, it turns out is gonna be given uh, exactly by the um, you know the part of this uh, marginal cost which is above the average total cost or above the uh, average variable cost depending on whether we are in the short run and in the long run i will dive into this a little bit more when i do my recap um you know next week when i do the recap of this stuff in fact hold your breath because i am gonna recap all of this right and also gonna be a video recap with a uh, like me you know actually rachel solving uh, a problem based on this we are going to give you a lot of opportunity to see this again because i 100 percent understand that this is maybe one of the most dense chapter in the book but just just so you know the supply curve can be interpreted as the marginal cost of a firm but it has to be at, at an acceptable price we're going to look at this more in depth during our recap and now you know there may be various things that might affect the willingness of a, a firm like this firm that we just see to produce like for example if inputs become um, cheaper they might want to produce more or if the technology gets better so there is less of that increasing costs or if there is an idea that in the future the price of the demand is going to go up that might change also the decision to produce uh, and uh, potentially if there is a drop in demand of other products that give this firm a competitive edge or there is an increase in the number of suppliers. So all of these are kind of changing the supply curves, sh shifting this supply curve to the right. When we do the recap, I'm gonna talk a little bit more clearly about how this is indeed affecting that supply curve uh, and push it, pushing this either to the right like this or to the left like that. Very good. Finally, we have this thing, which is, a very very technical aspect of the course i don't particularly love it but we have to do it it's a very important concept it's the price elasticity of demand this is basically saying how does the um, quantity produced by someone change when there is a small change in price imagine you are an interpreter you wake up and you see that the price of the product that you are selling is going a little bit up or a little bit down question is we want to know how you react to that at the moment you may wonder why do we even care about that response of the entrepreneur or the firm when there is a small change in price 
It doesn't make a lot of sense now, but we are going to see later on it has big impact on society. Uh, hence, it's an important thing to look at. But let me just, for the moment, just trust me, it's just a definition. It says the percentage change in quantity supplied resulting from a very small percentage change in price. That's the definition of elasticity of supply. And it basically tells you the, how responsive supply is to changes in price. And we are going to ask you to compute the elasticity of supply only for supply curves that are straight lines like this. So we are going to give a straight line, uh, something like this, and we are going to give you two points. We are going to see a lot of exercises like this uh, in um, your workshop. So don't worry, there are plenty of way of opportunities to uh, practice this. But essentially, the elasticity in a given point, so how responsive supply is at the given point in the, in the supply curve, is given by 1 divided the slope of the supply curve. And we are always going to give you a straight line supply curve, so you can easily determine the slope is rise divided by uh, run. Uh, and you, you determine the slope, and then you multiply it by the price at point A and the quantity at point A. So it's the slope uh, divided by, multiplied by the price at point A, which is three, divided by the quantity at point A, which is six, and this gives you the elasticity at point A. It's just kind of uh, a measure of how reactive the firm is, and it's expressed in a percentage term, so it doesn't depend on the price, and it's kind of handy to understand some of the economics of supply and demand. So if, for example, this number that you find is greater than one, then we say that supply is elastic, is very responsive to changing price. We call it unit elastic supply if this uh, elasticity is equal to one, or inelastic if the elasticity is less than one. And of course, how responsive a firm is depends on, for example, availability of inputs, raw materials, how easy it is for them to switch up the, the factors of production, um, for uh, how many inventories they have, and the, the time horizon. This is the end of this chapter. What I'm gonna do, so I'm, I'm gonna switch to the main camera. So what I'm gonna do in my recap, remember these recaps that we do are very generous. So what I'm gonna do during uh, next week recap, I'm gonna look back at that uh, big, table and I'm going to do the exercise again of what is the optimal amount of workers that you should hire. Then I'm going to show you how that changes when the price changes. Then I'm going to show you again the graph with the marginal cost and I'm going to be a little bit more precise about how that marginal cost graph uh, is equal under certain conditions to the supply curve. Then we are going to see how the supply curve changes, what are the market shocks that could change the supply curve. And then I'm going to spend in the recap a little bit of time doing one elasticity calculation. So I'm going to calculate, do a little exercise where I calculate the elasticity of uh, supply at a given point, just to give you that extra familiarity with it. It's a simple formula. You can just kind of memorize it. It's the interpretation is important, but not right away. So I don't want to spend too much time, but I do want to do an exercise because I think it's going to really cement your understanding. And remember, we are also going to post in the description of our videos from now on, and even in the old videos, we are going to post a link to a separate video that's going to have like a, a question workout that cover that particular chapter recap as well to give you even more confidence. Remember, we are going to, you're going to see this in the workshop. Let me just ask you, though, before, um, before I wrap up, let me just ask you if how fast, so it, was this class too fast for you? So, well, actually, let me rephrase it. I don't want to confuse people. So was the pace of this class good for you? Because I know the material is getting a little bit harder, so I want to understand if uh, how uncomfortable people were with the, the speed. I know that Isabella said, well, it was a little too fast, so I'm definitely looking out for that. Uh, and I'm a little concerned because it means maybe other 30 students, maybe roughly speaking, might have thought that this was too fast. I'm kind of mitigating this a little bit by doing the recaps um, and, and trying to guide you uh, 
to maybe look at the video with the, with the recap exercise as well. But I just want you to know, so please vo uh, sound off in, in the chat. Did you think the speed was okay uh, for this class? In general, for people like Is Isabella, who was like needed a little more time to think about this, um, I hope that chatting with Josh was helpful. But in general, maybe for the next class, if it's possible, go and try to do some of the exercises either in the chapter or at the end of the chapter where you are asked to use the table that I just showed you to calculate the optimal production for a firm. If you do that exercise a few times, and you come in next week with that clear in your head, I think during my recap, it will be a-okay. Because if you understand how to look at that table, what more or less it means, and how to calculate the optimal amount of workers and hence production for a firm, everything else, like the supply curve, optimal decision making, and even price elasticity is gonna make a lot of sense. I again bought a little bit of time chatting but now i'm going to turn to my um to the chat and see what's going on Ooh, that was a lot of action in there so thank thanks so much joshua for looking after everyone it seems like you didn't tag me so nobody needed uh, me to help them which is great oh uh, atman is asking me uh, ciao alberto come stai sto bene grazie come stai tutto bene uh, they're asking me if, if I'm okay, if I'm doing okay. Si, si, sto bene, grazie mille, grazie mille. So, uh, Marky says, um, it was good, thanks. Pacing was good, all good. I thought it was pretty good. In fairness, I did econ in high school. Very considerate. Thank you, Zane. I found the pace of the first half a little too fast, but the pace of the rest of the lecture was not a problem at all. Isabella, thank you so much. It's really reassuring. Pace was good, 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 good. The concept later in the lecture, were easier for me to understand. Uh, okay, perfect. Then it looks like I'm not shocking people too much with the speed, which is good. And I'm hoping that with the recap, we really catch up on, on everything. But remember, you can always go to any workshop you want, literally any workshop, and you can ask any question you want to your demonstrator. They are fantastic. So please go ahead. We have two of them, right? The senior and the junior exactly to offer you the opportunity to ask more questions and resolve any doubt. It's so good. It's so good to have you live with me asking questions, telling me, uh, telling me how the, the, the class is going. So helpful. I would have no idea otherwise. So you, by coming online and not just watching the recording, you out there, you out there in that webcam, by coming to class and actually giving me feedback, you're really doing a public good for everybody. Because people that just watch the recording, they're definitely going to benefit from uh, the feedback that you give me in terms of the speed so that they can adjust, so it benefits everybody. I show up, you show up, this is great. Of course, very happy for everybody that cannot make it uh, or want to use this as, as a recap to watch the recording, that, that's what this is for timestamps in the description, all of that. Watch it at double speed. It's going to be really good. Fantastic. Uh, someone is asking uh, when is the online workshop and Josh is lightning speed giving the answer. Uh, Owen is saying, I think the way uh, you build up an intuitive understanding of the table was really great. Oh, thank you, Owen. That was exactly what I was hoping to do. Like instead of throwing definitions at you, I was hoping I'm just going to show you the number and I'm going to trust that you're going to be like, oh, yeah, this is a fixed cost because it never changes. So it's fixed. If, if, if I start from that definition, you would be like, what are you? What? Why are you giving me all these definitions? And I have no idea why I, I would be using them. But that's why we, we are trying to understand what is the extra cost of taking an action and then measure that against the extra benefit for each unit that we are producing and selling. So this is fantastic. Thank you so much for coming. I hope you have a great day and also a great weekend. And the weather is a little better in, in Sydney today, so I uh, hope it stays that way. And in the meantime, uh, best wishes from the Econ 101 team. Uh, have a, uh, a great weekend and see you very, very soon. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you later. Bye-bye.